We have been talking about Laodicea. Laodicea, among the seven churches in Revelation, had a big problem. A bigger problem than all the other churches that John wrote the letters to because it's the only church that Jesus has nothing good to say about it. All the other churches, no matter how bad, they, how far they had moved away from God, even, even the church Pergamum that, that was there where the throne of Satan is, there was still some good. And yet, here Laodicea struggles. The, the reason of Laodicean struggle, the reason the, the only, there's only bad things to say is because they've done something tragic. As we learn, starting off this series, they somehow locked Jesus outside. Remember Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And the only reason why you knock on a door is because you're outside that door and you want, to be, you want to come back in. Somehow the church of Laodicea had locked Jesus out. Remember, when Jesus said this, he said he was standing among the golden lampstands. He's supposed to be there amidst the churches, but somehow they had kicked him out. And as a result of kicking Jesus out, symptoms would arise among the church. They would become lukewarm. They would become... Wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And we've been looking at those symptoms to find out, has it happened to us? Are we possibly Laodicean? Maybe corporately, maybe individually. Is there a lukewarmness? Is there a stagnation in our spiritual life? If so, we might be Laodicean. But we found out that there, this is not an end of the road. This is not a time like, well, we, I guess we didn't make it, so we're done. Because at the end of that passage in Revelation, he says, to him who overcomes, to her who overcomes. Here's the beautiful part of it. We can't overcome Laodicea. All we have to do is open up the door. But before we can understand we need to open up the door, we need to recognize the symptoms because otherwise, we, according to the, what it says about Laodicea, they feel like they have everything they need. And as long as you think you have everything you need spiritually, you're not going to realize that Jesus is outside. And so we've looked at what it means to be lukewarm, stagnant in our relationship. We looked last time at what it means to be uh, spiritually poor. And this morning we're going to look at the understanding of spiritual blindness. We're going to look at a cure for the visually impaired. And before we open up in God's Word, I invite you one more time to bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, what a privilege it is for us to come together on your Sabbath day. It's an honor for us to be able to lift up in voice and in song and in, in our offerings and our prayers worship to you. And we pray that it has been a sweet sound in your ears but it is also vital for us to hear from you. So as we open up your word, as I open up my mouth, speak to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Charlie Boswell was blinded during World War II while rescuing his friend from a burning tank when the tank exploded. Before the war, he was already a great athlete, before this accident, he was known for his athleticism, and in a testimony to his talent and determination, he decided to try a new sport, a sport that he never even imagined doing while he was sighted. He decided to play golf. Through determination and a deep love for the game, he became the national blind golf champion. He won that title 13 times, along with making three hole-in-ones. Now, I don't know, I, I have to stop here for a second because I don't know if you know about the game of golf, but making a hole-in-one is not that easy. I've been playing for a while, and I've not even made one, and I can see. And, and he, was so, he, was, he became so good that he made three hole-in-ones while not being able to see. One of his heroes was the great Ben Hogan, a very well-known golf, golfer, and and by that time, he had had a, 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 a Hogan Award, Ben Hogan Award, and it was an honor for Charlie to win this award in 1958. 
during that time when he won the award, he actually award, he got to meet Ben Hogan, and, and he was awestruck, and he stated that, that he had just one wish. If he had one wish, he would love to be able to play a round of golf with the great Ben Hogan. Mr. Hogan agreed that it would be a, a wonderful thing to play together, and, and it would be an honor for him as well, because he had heard all about Charlie's accomplishments and truly admired his skill. And then, out of the blue... Charlie blurted out, would you like to play for money, Mr. Hogan? I can't play for money. It wouldn't be fair, said Mr. Hogan. Oh, come on. $1,000 a hole. I can't. What would people think of me taking advantage of you in your circumstances? Are you chicken, Mr. Hogan? Then Hogan got frustrated. Okay, but I'm going to play my best. I wouldn't expect anything else, said the confident Boswell. You're on then, Mr. Boswell. You name the time and place. Excellent, the self-assured Boswell replied, replied, 10 o'clock tonight. (laughs) Blindness is, in fact, a matter of perspective. For for Charlie, he could play at any time. He could play it in, in the middle of the night and easily beat Ben Hogan. And if you've ever been in a situation where the lights were turned out, you also understand how sudden blindness can hit you. If you, if you gathered a bunch of blinded people and sighted people in a, in a large cavern in Mammoth Caves and then turned out the lights, it levels the playing field. Everyone then can't see. But I could imagine it would be the only the sighted people who would panic. They're the only ones who would realize something had just been taken from them. It's, it's actually like an experience I had when I was at, uh, working at Camp Asabo that one of the weeks during the summer was blind camp. And, and we were taught how to, to work with the, the blind campers, and we had to even go through the, uh, uh, like, before they even showed up, we would have blindfolds on and sh- uh, train each other on how to be able to let them know where things were and, like, when we ate and stuff like that. We had to experience what they experienced. But even with that, I guess I didn't understand. I was a counselor that summer, and, and uh, it was the evening, and the, the boys were so excited with the day's activities that they couldn't settle down. And so I unleashed my favorite threat of the summer and had worked every week up to this point. I said, if you don't quiet down, I'm going to turn off the lights. It got quiet for a second, and then they just burst out laughing. And they said, we didn't even know they were on. I wasn't thinking, I didn't understand what they were going through. I didn't know. They they just laughed at me. Without being physically blind, though, we, we don't understand what it's like to not be able to see. But I've noticed that even if we're not physically blind, we can be blinded by many other things. Every one of us has experienced a car driving up in our blind spot. We can be blinded by ambition, blinded by love. Interestingly, strangest of all, we can be blinded by our sight. This is what seems to have happened to the church of Laodicea. They were blinded by their presumed ability to see. They claimed to be able to see. They claimed to have everything that they needed. They claimed to understand. And yet after Jesus' eye exam, they are diagnosed with blindness. So what we find is another symptom of kicking Jesus out, another symptom of trying to do Christianity without Christ, it's spiritual blindness. We find ourselves in a situation where we cannot see spiritually. Once again, Laodiceans would be shocked to learn that they have this symptom. Because if, if you've never been able to see, you don't know what it is like to see. And unfortunately, we start this world spiritually blind. And, and sometimes it actually can gradually decrease. Uh, maybe you've experienced this as well, too. Sometimes our eyesight can gradually decrease to the point where we really can't see as well as we thought we could until we get glasses or, or some kind of aid to help us or surgery. So here we have a problem of spiritual blindness because a Christian suffering from the absence of Jesus in their lives will not realize that they are blind. If you're trying to test this out by looking around, you're missing the idea. Again, this is spiritual blindness. This is not physical blindness that they're suffering from. The Greek word here that calls them blind doesn't talk about eyesight. It talks about understanding. The Greek word literally means to be unable to understand, incapable of comprehending. 
What, what Laodicea's problem was in this situation was they could not comprehend spiritual things. They had a hard time understanding spiritual things. And it makes sense. If Jesus is not there with you, if you're not re- relying on him for your, your spiritual understanding and definitions, it will be a hard time understanding things from heaven. Now it makes sense why the Pharisees had such a hard time understanding what Jesus was teaching. The idea is that Laodiceans believe they understand spiritual things when they do not. They claim to recognize the truth of God when they can't. As Paul put it, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, he said, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. See, this is the most tragic thing about this symptom. We can miss out the beauty and simplicity of the gospel. The beauty of the good news of Jesus. We can miss it. We won't understand it. We won't grasp it. Because you see, if Jesus was in the room, if he was to show up right now, the truth of our condition would become completely evident. Just look at any Bible passage in the New Testament, in the, in the Gospels, as Jesus was in a, in a group, the group was divided. Remember, as I said before, if Jesus is in your presence, you can't stay uh, lukewarm. You're going to become hot or cold, right? Right? The same thing when it comes to spiritual sight. If Jesus is in your room, you're going to realize either that you're blind or you're going to recognize you can see. You're going to think you can see. Interestingly, just as it was with the, uh, the, the, the spiritual poverty, the moment that we think we're rich is actually when we are poor. The, 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 the richer that we think we are spiritually, the more destitute we are in heaven's eyes. And it's the same thing with sight. The more I think I understand, the more I go, I know it all. You know what? I go to a church that has the full truth. We are, we are in danger when we say that, when we believe that, because what we're saying is there's nothing left for me to learn, and then I say, I can see. Now, I got it. I got all the understanding. There's nothing more for me to learn. You know, sadly, we as Adventists should be the, we should know we, we, we should never take this stance because we're constantly educating other people about truths that we believe that they haven't heard yet. And we say, yes, you may have heard this all your life, but this is in the Bible. You should, so why aren't we willing to continue walking in new truth? Why would we take the assumption that there's nothing left for us to learn? Do we think God is that simple? Do we think that heaven is that simple that we could just learn it easily in less than a lifetime? Friends, we will spend eternity learning about God. So we must understand that right now, here in this place, there's still much for us to learn. Jesus said that when he came, John John 9, verse 39, he says, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. He said, I came here to turn things upside down. He said, I, I... his presence would reveal the, our, the reality of our ability to recognize spiritual things. And as a result, those who admitted their blindness would receive sight. If I admit that I don't know everything, he can teach me. But those who profess to see, they would become blind. The moment I approach Christ with the attitude that I already know everything, he can't teach me anything. And then I become one of those who do not understand. In fact, when Jesus made that statement here in John chapter 39, a few of the Pharisees happened to be standing there, and they reacted with a typical Laodicean response. They said, are we blind too? Now, the fun- funny thing about this, uh, this answer, you would, we would think, we would read into it thinking that they were actually curious, that they were like, are we blind? But in the Greek, the way it's written out, you can tell by the way the question is written out if they're expecting a yes answer or a no answer. And so when they asked this question, they were asking it, expecting a no answer. They're basically saying, you're not saying we're blind, right? Because he made this statement, and everybody's hearing it, and they want to make sure that Jesus isn't calling them out on being blind, because of anybody that was standing near Jesus that day, they couldn't have been the ones that were blind. They were teachers of the law. They knew their scripture. They knew it. So you you want to see if they know it? Let's hold a seminar right now. Bible trivia, let's do it. They knew they could not be the ones he was talking about that were spiritually blind. 
Tragically, very few of them would end up recognizing and admitting this problem in themselves. Because Jesus' answer to them was not likely the answer that they were hoping to hear. As, as they asked this question, are, are you saying we're blind? You're not saying that, right? He said this in verse 40, 41, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. You would have no sin, as some translations say. But now that you say we see, your guilt, your sin remains. See what Jesus is saying here. By taking that stance, I understand spiritual things, is the very moment that I become blind. It is having that constant belief that I don't understand everything that allows Jesus to work with me. This shouldn't have surprised the, the Pharisees, him to say this, because on many other occasions he, he called them out on their spiritual blindness. In fact, he even said that they were the blind leading the blind. They were blind leaders. Their inability to understand spiritual things was evident to Jesus. If they would only accept their blindness, if they would only accept that there was more for them to learn through Christ, he could help. But sadly, they wouldn't. This, this uh, symptom has been persistent, has been seen in man for a long time. And, and, and the way that it's described in Isaiah chapter 29 is shocking. Isaiah chapter 29, if you have your Bibles, turn with me. We'll be reading verses 9 through 12. Isaiah chapter 29, God points out this same symptom that happened in the day of Israel. Listen to what it says. Isaiah 29 verse 9 says, Astonish yourself and be astonished. Blind yourself and be blind. Be drunk but not with wine. Stagger but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured out on you a spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, the prophets, and covered your heads, the seers. And the vision of all this has become to like the words of a book that is sealed. And when a man gives it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it's sealed. And when he gives the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. He, he talks about the, the people of Israel saying that they have become blind. They will not understand the things of God. He says, I've closed the eyes of your seers. And, and when the, even this prophecy itself, when it comes to you, you're like, I don't understand. It's like a book that's sealed. I can't open it. I can't unlock it. What's causing this? Notice what he says in verse 13. And, be, and the Lord says, because this people draw near with their mouth, Honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by, ben, by men. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, and wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Did you catch that? We read this verse before, didn't we? When we were looking at the lukewarmness of Laodicea, we, we saw that lukewarmness comes when we're, we're stagnant, when we're just going through motions, when we, we honor God with our lips, but our hearts aren't in it. And here we see that same verse in its context saying that when we live that way, when our, our relationship with God is just motions, it's just we go through, we have a checklist, we read our Bible like we're supposed to, not to meet Jesus, we pray like we're supposed to, but hoping to get something from Jesus, we go to church so people think we're holy. When we go through the motions, it says that we end up spiritually blind. He says, I'm going to do amazing things with these people. I'm going to shut off their vision. These were, these were the Israelites' friends. These were God's people, the ones who had access to the, the scrolls, the ones who had access to, to the wisdom of God, and yet they were blind spiritually. Why? Because they had no relationship with God. They had decided that they didn't need it because they had possession of the truth. They were God's people. That was good enough for them. They didn't feel like they needed anything further than them. When we fake our relationship with God, though, our wisdom and discernment die out. This is why regardless of the pleasant appearances of our worship and our supposed knowledge of Scripture, if Jesus is not in us, we know nothing. And the stuff that we do know is probably mixed up. Because let me tell you, we cannot bring secular ideas into the church and think they're going to work for the glory of God. It doesn't work that way, friends. 
We constantly try to fix the church with worldly wisdom, and it doesn't happen. The only thing that can, that can, that can uh, build up the church is God's wisdom. Remember, the head of the church is not us. It's not me. It's not the, 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 the church board or the church and business session. It's not the general conference president. The head of the church is Jesus Christ. And so if the church is following Jesus, getting his wisdom in his direction, the church is going to be fine. But when we try to do church without Jesus as the head, it doesn't turn out very well. There's actually another warning in Isaiah that's just as shocking. It's in Isaiah chapter 9. It's Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Isaiah chapter 6. This is a message from God for Isaiah to send to the people. He says in verse 9, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the hearts of this people dull and their ears heavy and their eyes and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. You see, God is, is giving us a formula here, letting us know that if we would actually humble ourselves before him, we can be healed. If we will actually open up our ears and open up our eyes and actually look to God for the truth. You see, if, if, I, if, I, go to, if I go to Google first before I go to God's word, I'm going to stay blind. If I go to, to my favorite Christian author before I go to God's word, I'm going to stay blind. I have to go to Jesus first. He says here that if I actually will look, if I will actually search for him, I will find him. If we could see, we would turn to Jesus and we would be healed of everything else. As Jesus said to the Pharisees, if, if we were blind, if we accepted that we know nothing about God, we can be given sight. But if we will continue to pretend that we know it all, holding on to our own wisdom, our own traditions, how we do things, then our blindness is incurable. So how can we end time Laodiceans receive sight if we are blind? Well, again, the cure there is there in the, the letter to Laodiceans in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18, where Jesus started, we learned last time, he told us to buy from him. And we understand that buying from him is, if you're already poor, how can you buy? But he's talking about you, you're, you're going to receive from him. You have to accept this. This is a gift from him. He wants us to, first to buy gold refined by the fire so that we may be rich. And then notice the rest of verse 18. The next part of 18 says, um, or the last part of the 18, uh, salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. He's asking us to buy from him this eye salve so that we might be able to see, so he can apply it this time it's medicine for our eyes. And it's interesting, the word here that talks about anointing, the salve to anoint your eyes. It's the same word that Jesus uses, that the Bible uses when Jesus healed the blind man in John chapter 9. The, t the context of this story of the, the scripture reading, is, as it was mentioned, uh, that, that there's this m man who was born blind, and Jesus came to heal him. And if you remember the story correctly, the, 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 the disciples had asked Jesus, well, who, blind, who, who sinned, this man or his parents? I mean, because the, the, their mindset was they must have done something wrong with God if they were in this condition. And Jesus says Neither, none of that happened. This happened so that God be, could be glorified. So God, Jesus was about to do something amazing that day. And he did do something amazing, although he did something quite unorthodox. When Jesus went to this blind man to heal him, he went, bent down, spit onto the ground, he started to mix up his spit with this mud. And I know there's a whole bunch of medical professionals right now going, that's, that's not orthodox. That's not in our manuals. He took this mud and then proceeded to anoint this man on his eyes. That's what the, the, it uses the word anoint. He anointed the man's eyes. He took his mixed spit mud and he smeared it on this blind man's eyes. Now again... I'm going out on a limb here because I, you know, I didn't graduate in medicine, but I'm going to guess that's not normal protocol, right? No. And then Jesus tells this man, go wash off the mud. 
I'm, gonna, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to assume that if the man could see, he wouldn't have let Jesus do this. Right? You see, I'm mixing, uh, you're not putting that on my eyes. I mean, I don't know if you have COVID. I, this man had no idea. What, it didn't matter. He knew that Jesus was there. He'd actually never met Jesus, obviously. Jesus smeared the mud on his eyes, said, go wash it off. He went to the pool, washed off his eyes, and he came back able to see. Unorthodox, but effective. The creator was able to recreate. What a marvelous miracle. I think it's just amazing. Shortly after he's healed, the Pharisees hear, hear about it, and they call him into the synagogue, and they begin to question him about this healer. And, and at first we might think, well, of course they would want to know who was able to heal like this, but that wasn't the problem. That wasn't the concern of the Pharisees. You see, the bigger issue to them was this healing occurred on the Sabbath. And every good Jew knew that you were not allowed to heal on the Sabbath. If they, were not chron- if they were not dying in that moment, if this was just a chronic illness, it could wait till tomorrow. You weren't supposed to do it today. Isn't that lo- a lovely rule? So that's the reason why they brought him into the synagogue, because they actually wanted to find out who it was so they could condemn the person who actually healed this man mir- miraculously on a day that the, the tradition said should never have happened. Well, the interview went on for a while, and they couldn't get anything out of this guy because the guy didn't see who it was. He said, I don't know who he was. All I know is that I was blind, and now I see. So they call in the guy's parents. Tell us who healed this man. Now, the parents were probably afraid of the Pharisees. They didn't want to answer. They said, hey, he's old enough. Ask him yourself. So they bring him back in, and he keeps going back and forth, back and forth. And, And finally, after all this questioning, this man asks, are you wanting to be his disciples too? Their response is jaw-dropping. I would have expected the Pharisees to say, we are disciples of God. But they didn't say that. Look at in John chapter 9. You will see that it says, they said, we are disciples of Moses. You see, something that happens that we don't realize is that when we have locked Jesus outside, when we've locked God out of our relationship, we don't have a personal relationship with him, we will end up following anyone else. I'm actually, I'm, I'm concerned that today, if it was we were pressured like that, some people might say, I'm, don't, don't you ac- accuse me of being a disciple. I'm a disciple of Ellen White's. I'm a disciple of, just put anybody else's name there. I'm the disciple of the Adventist church. You're not supposed to be. You're supposed to be a disciple of Jesus. The Pharisees missed this, and in their anger, they, they said, they, they, they condemned this man, and, and he said, his response to them, it, it was, he, he was shocked. He says, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They were so infuriated by that response that they kicked him out. It wasn't just kicking him out of the building. When, when they kicked him out of the synagogue, they were basically banning him from the synagogue. They were telling him he was no longer welcome to come back before God. Disfellowshipping him, basically. So what, this, what happened to this man was he just received his life on the same day as being kicked out of the church for saying, I was healed. Now what comes next, I think, is the most beautiful story in the Gospels. The Bible says that when Jesus heard that he had been kicked out of the synagogue, he went after the man. There's no story in the Gospels where Jesus runs after the people when they got offended with what he taught. John chapter 6, he's ta- teaching about, the, about uh, his sacrifice and how they're going to have to take part in the offering, and they thought it was cannibalism, and lots of people left, and he didn't chase after one of them and say, I'm sorry, let me change it. I, it's not, I, 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 can, I can change my message. He didn't, he didn't do that. He didn't run after people who got offended by the, the Gospel message, but he ran after the person who was hurt by the religious leaders. I love this story. He seeks him out. This man couldn't have went looking for Jesus. He didn't know what Jesus looked like. Jesus went for him. He looked for him. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? What an interesting question. He goes there and doesn't ask him, 
how's your sight? He goes there and performs, to, 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 he actually goes there and uh, examines how the heavenly LASIK surgery went. He asks them a question, do you believe in the Son of Man? That is the question, do you believe in the Messiah? And the man answers, I, I do, but I don't know who he is. I would if I knew, but I've never seen him before. I'm sure a smile crept up on Jesus' face when he said that. And then Jesus does something that he did very rarely throughout his ministry. And again, friends, understand the beauty of this. He says, you have seen him. He's the one speaking to you right now. Jesus did not go around telling everybody he was Messiah. But to this man who believed he was just rejected by God, he showed up as God. Isn't that beautiful? He's, he, I, I would gladly, I, would, I believe in the Messiah. I just never met him before. And Jesus says, you have met him. I'm standing right in front of you. Now, Jesus had said similar words before. He had talked about being the I am. He had talked, he'd used terms calling himself the Son of Man, and it made the Pharisees so angry that they actually even gathered up stones ready to stone him. They wanted to end him for blasphemy. They had seen it as such a horrible thing to say. But what was this man's response? When Jesus says, I am the one you're looking for, I am the Son of Man, I am the Messiah, it says the man immediately fell to his knees and began to worship. You see, that's what having spiritual sight does to you. When Jesus is in your midst, you want to worship him. This is what it's all about, friends. This man could finally see, not just physically, he was able to see spiritually. The smearing of the blood and mud not only allowed the man to see Jesus, but to help him to recognize him as his Savior. It's the work of the Messiah. It's the healing that Jesus wants us to buy from him. But we have to admit that we need it. We have to confess that we're blind. And this is actually very difficult for people that have so much truth. It's very difficult for people who have so much understanding of, of prophecy, of Scripture, of, of, of the, the things that God's asked us to do to actually admit that there's some things we don't understand. And maybe that we don't even understand the things that we think we understand. I mean, how many of you, having known what a scripture meant, read it later on in life and found it meaning something even greater, something different sometimes? That your own journey in life has changed the, the meaning of certain passages to you. Has, has that happened to anybody else here? So, so you see that even the verse that you knew you understood comes back later and is now re-explained to you through life. If that's possible with just small passages here and there, then could it be possible also then that there's so much more to know about God than we realize? Isn't it possible then that, 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 we, that it's easy, while it's easy for us to, to look to the world and say, well, if this is successful there, it's going to work here, that that's not true, that we need to go to, ev to Jesus for everything, that if there's a problem that we need to solve, we get on our knees. If, if, there's a, if there's a program that we want to do, we first go to our knees and ask if God wants us to do it. Don't you think that this is where we should be going? Always to Jesus. He's the source of our truth. He's going to be the one who helps us to see. If we admit it, if we confess that we are blind, Jesus can give us sight. But if he's a great physician, how can he help somebody who thinks they're all right? He came, he says, not for the, the healthy, not for the sighted. He came for the blind. He came for the ones who are sick. If you are spiritually blind, if you know you don't have understanding of everything, then Jesus can make it so that you can see. But we have to admit it. Can you see right now? How about you? Do you think you got pretty much everything in the Bible? Well, you know, pretty down pat. Or is it possible that that there are some things that you don't understand. The, the question is, do you want to see? Do you really want to see? Because if you want to see, it's a simple process. We go over to the door, we open the door, and let Jesus back in. 
We get to know him, see him for who he is. Let him teach us, reteach us. Again, how often did Jesus have to say, you've heard it said, but I tell you. I mean, we don't know how often he said it throughout his ministry, but we know he has it in his great Sermon on the Mount. He had to reteach basic concepts, the things that we would think it would be easy to understand. He's like, this is what you've heard. This is what's been taught, but let me reteach you. Friends, that is the best education you could ever get. Sitting at Jesus' feet, tell, him, him, him telling you, this is what you've heard all your life, but this is the truth from heaven. Why would we want to stumble around trying to feel our way around in Christianity, thinking that we have sight when Jesus can give us true sight? But we have to accept it. Jesus is offering us medicine for our eyes to give us sight. Will you accept it? Is this something that you want today? Do you want Jesus to anoint your eyes so that you can truly see? Is that your desire this morning? Father in heaven, you see our hands. You know our hearts. You know maybe that right now we're struggling, we can't even raise our hand, and maybe we're raising our hand because we want people to see our hand but you know our hearts and our motives. And you've, you've told us, you made it very clear here that when we claim to be able to see, that we are only blind. But Jesus has come to set that straight. And if we'll admit it this morning, and as, as we're raising our hands and we have a true desire in our heart to see, we ask that you will open our eyes. Anoint our eyes with the eyes salve from heaven so that we may see spiritually, that we may see Jesus for who he is, that we can understand the heavenly truths and live them out to your glory. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.